He didn't keep anything in reserve, okay? In fact, financially, uh, when they needed to pay the tax money, Matthew 17, I believe it is, Jesus sent, you know, Peter to do a miracle, uh, catch a fish, and the, the, the money was in the fish's mouth to pay the taxes. So Jesus didn't have a savings account. <laughs> I'm not saying it's all a sin to have a savings account, but if you're rich, if you got a savings account, you're actually rich. You're, you know, well, I'm not rich compared to a lot of Americans, so I'm not rich. That's not how you judge riches, okay? If you got more than your basic necessities, period, you're rich. And this is the richest country in the history of the world. So, in First Timothy six, around verse uh, what, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 1 Timothy 6, he talks about charge them that are rich, that they be rich in good works, so that they lay up a foundation against the day of com coming, you know, the, the days ahead, the judgment to come. Uh, Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, that how uh, hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of heaven. Think about it. Have riches. And then he says, two verses later, uh, how hardly shall those that tr they that trust in riches, okay, you know, perhaps people have and they retain a lot of money in the bank that could be used for the glory of God uh, because they're trusting in it. Well, I've got to make sure I'm secure and, you know, this and that. And, you know, uh, who knows, you know, I've got to pay this rent next month. You know, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness when he's speaking about provision. And all these things shall be added unto you and take no thought for the morrow for sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Where is your trust? It is, in, is it in your money? Is that your security? Or is it in Christ? God says that we need to obey him. If you love me, keep my commandments. Did he that provided that money for you, is he not able to provide more? Does God not give seed to the sower? 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 through 11. I'm just posing some questions here, friend. What kind of fruit is abounding to your eternal account? Is it empty? I got good news for you. Th today is the first day of the rest of your life. And you can be blessed to lay up treasure in heaven and have fruit abounding to your account in eternal glory. Our foundational scripture in this message is Philippians 4.17. The Apostle Paul, the great overseer and under-shepherd of Jesus, the, the, the model of how we should be tending to and serving the body of Christ. He said this, uh, not because, listen, you guys... I want you to help the work of Christ, but it's not because I desire a gift. Quote, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, if a person is self-serving and self-seeking, they tend to project that same evil disposition on others. So they can't quite imagine that somebody in this world has their best interest in mind. And I can tell you, a lot of people don't, but there are some that do. And the Apostle Paul is one of those people. He not only had the Philippians and the early church, all of the early church that he went about ministering to, all over Asia Minor, uh, he not only had their best interests in mind, he's writing these letters, and whether he knew it or not, uh, this was going to be at least for 2,000 and something years that these letters were going to be in force as a very divinely inspired scriptures. Okay. God had this stuff put down so that you could have his word, you could have his wisdom and you could lay up treasure in heaven. And there are those people today, not an overabundance of them, but that care that fruit abounds to your account. This is not man's work, folks. We are the body of Christ. A body has many members. First Corinthians 12 Romans 5, uh, 12, I'm sorry, uh, first Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4, the body of Christ. Every joint supplies, the scripture says. Every person does their part. And one of the things we're to do is provoke one another unto love and good works. And one of those good works is to give and be a generous giver. Okay? So that not just because you love God, you love his people. Amen. And you're willing and desirous to give. I don't, I don't know about you, but it's more blessed to give than to receive, Jesus said. I can tell you, man, I've never had more uh, joy than when I was giving. You know, uh, and people want to thank you. It's like, <laughs> no, thank you, man. Thank God this opportunity came up. And, uh, you know, so, but um, 
the scripture says if you water you'll be watered also and the liberal soul shall be made fat but those that hoard are going to be under a curse and the people are going to hate them that's uh proverbs chapter 11 verse 24 through 27 so let's provoke one of the love uh, one another to love and good works beloved i hope that this message is stirring you a little bit to be a generous giver of your life and of that which god puts into your hands jesus looks at our works and we're going to be judged according to our works as we began to say earlier i will give unto every one of you according to your works revelation 2 23 notice what he says here the whole verse he, oh, well, part of it here. All the churches and all the churches shall know that I am he, Jesus said, which searcheth the reins in the hearts. He looks at our heart, right? And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Notice the two key words here, or two of the key words. Uh, God searches the hearts, underline that, and works. He searches our, or he, he's going to reward us according to our works. Why? Because our works are, uh, you know, a reflection of what's in our heart for the most part every child is known by what he does proverbs 20 verse 11 you know and good uh fruit can't come out of a corrupt tree and bad fruit can't come out of a a good tree uh jesus said he taught in matthew 12 etc also verse 26 here of revelation 2 jesus says and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nation. God wants us busy about his business. You're bought with a price. You're not your own. Okay? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus and the good works. We are to be busy about the Father's business. Busy about the Father's business, I might add, is not wearing a little pink ribbon because you're campaigning for uh, breast cancer with Susan G. Coleman, who, who actually, the organization that actually gives hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to Planned Parenthood to murder children. Okay, that's how deceived people are, that they're supporting filthy, I iniquitous organizations like that. That's not the work of Christ. Giving isn't so you uh, can just feel better about yourself either. It's about obeying God. Okay, giving of yourself and of your time, treasure, and talents to the work of God, that which is fulfilling a New Testament purpose. What is that New Testament purpose? Well, get in the Word, and God will show you. It's very clear. Go. You might want to start with the Great Commission commands of Jesus at the end of each of the four Gospels. Okay, so, uh, okay, Numbers 31.27 says, And divide the prey into two parts between them that uh, took the war upon them, who went out to the battle, and between all the congregation. So this again reiterates that everyone that partakes in the work of Christ and seeing people one to Jesus and no matter what their capacity in helping that happen, prayer, giving financially to provide for those that are traveling like Paul did. That's some of the money that uh, you know Paul was given in Philippians 4, I think we say it was to help him travel. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see Paul on three missionary journeys. Okay, going from town to town, that costs a little money. It's good that it costs money, folks. If you don't want to give, don't bother. God loves a cheerful giver. But for those that love the Lord Jesus Christ and want to see his word prospering in the hearts of men and furthered in the earth to the ends of the earth and for the kingdom to be built in the hearts of men by the word of God being sown in their heart, uh, you and I desire that. We joyfully jump in and do what we get privilege to do to, to help that to uh to, to happen so this is the law of spoils the equal reward that is going to everyone involved no matter what we see that in first samuel 30 verse 24 i want you to write that down go underline and study that okay and then also that's again first samuel 30 24 also numbers 31 27 let me read it again and divide the prey he says into two parts between them that took the war upon them who went out to battle and between all the congregation those on the front line in other words and those that sent them there are goers and senders in the work of Christ sometimes you're one uh, you play one part sometimes you play both parts okay uh, all of us that's uh, Romans 10 about verse 14 you know right in there how can they go except they sent you know uh, the labors of the gospel. He's talking about in verse 15 there of Romans 10, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who bring good tidings of great joy. He's quoting the prophet Isaiah out of Isaiah 52, 7. Okay, all right. 
you will notice also in the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus how that um, there were Moses uh, was weary in the battle and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands while and as long as Moses' hands were up in the air uh, they were winning the battle and they all are going to be and got rewarded uh, equally okay there's an equal reward God sees everything it doesn't matter if you're sweating if you helped you're getting rewarded that's just how the Lord is there's equality that word appears in 2nd Corinthians chapter 8 I believe a few different times equality get that biblical word in your heart and in your mind beloved there is an equality with God he will equally equality reward each of those that are engaged in his work regardless of what part they played fruit that may abound to your account beloved God wants you to get an eternal vision our conversation or our way of life is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ Philippians chapter 3 verse 21 in that passage the Apostle Paul is contrasting those that mind earthly things to those who have their affections set on above things above not on the things of the earth get an eternal perspective beloved go read the last two chapters in the Bible and look at the new Jerusalem and and, and let the fear of God come upon you and the joy of the Lord to uh, desire to be there not to miss it and to be disqualified in the end but to keep under your body and to bring it into subjection and not only that uh, desire and get a vision of being there not only being there but also being there with great reward okay all the glory is going to go to Jesus Christ but I, you know uh, I can't apologize for what he put in his word as far as a, a incentive to partake in eternal rewards by uh, you know what you get he says you know if you sow bountifully you reap bountifully but if you sow stingily okay that's not the word he used he, he uses if you sow sparingly you'll reap also sparingly but he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully that's incentive God is incentivizing you you're on notice beloved God wants you to be blessed in eternity well brother I'm gonna be blessed because of Jesus don't over spiritualize this okay uh, there is a reward plan first Corinthians 3 is the judgment of the righteous you know and how we're gonna have rewards and some rewards are gonna be lost possibly uh, you can go read that there's there we're all gonna stand to, to give account and we're gonna be rewarded accordingly okay according to our deeds on this earth in fact in the Matthew 25 Jesus speaks about and I know this is the judgment of the nations concerning Israel, but it's also the same principles that are going to stand true in our judgment, period. Okay, so don't give me this stuff that it only applies to Israel. God's going to judge us also with his same divine, unchanging, perfectly just uh, tenets, if you will. And he said, inasmuch as you did it under one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. So if you bless a child of God, if you bless a Jew or a true Jew, which is a born-again Christian, in any way, God is going to reward you, beloved, uh, whether you like it or not, I should say. <laughs> okay, and inasmuch as you did it not unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it not unto me. And then he says, depart from me, you curse in the everlasting fire. God does not take it lightly when we refuse to help those that we have a chance to help and to help his work. God does not. You, I didn't make that up. Go read it for yourself. I believe that's uh, Matthew 25, 40 through 46, right at the end of Matthew 25. Depart from me, curse and everlasting fire. We've got to take account for our lives here. Now, okay, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 through 11. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Okay, the note in the study Bible says Christians can give either generously or sparingly. God will reward them accordingly. To Paul, giving is not a loss, but a form of saving. It results in substantial benefits for those who give. He is not speaking primarily of the quantity given, but of the quality of our hearts, desires, and motives. The poor widow gave little, but God considered it much because of the proper proportion she gave of the complete dedication 
uh, and the complete dedication she reflected. That's what we referred to a little bit earlier when the widow gave two mites. That equal less than a penny. She gave more than everybody, Jesus said, that was giving. Because some of them guys were tossing in what would equal uh, hundreds and even thousands of dollars. But that was just a token tip compared to what they had reserved at home or in their bank account. So, beloved, be encouraged to sow bountifully so you'll reap bountifully. Verse 7, 2 Corinthians 9 says, Every man according as he purposes in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. Uh, no coercion should be put over Christians. Uh, for God loveth what kind? A cheerful. In the Greek that means a uh, hilarious giver. It should be a joy to give, especially to the right cause. Now, somebody, if you have a question in your mind or heart, where to give or how to, any of that, just pray. God is with you. And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask him God to give it to all men liberally, liberally and abradeth not, it shall, it shall, it shall be given him. James 1 5. Okay, verse 8, 2 Corinthians 9 says, And God is able. I love that. God is able. Hallelujah. If you ever say God is able, you're saying scripture, inspired scripture, right there. It's not the only place, but that is one of them. 2 Corinthians 9 8. Now listen to this verse. Wow. This truth. And God is able. To make all grace abound toward you, you that have given, that is, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Hallelujah. God desires free will offerings. Desire, uh, he desires a cheerful or the hilarious giver. Okay, verse 9, as it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministered seed to the sower, both ministered bread for your food, and multiply your seed, sown, and increase the fruit, fruits of your righteousness. Increase the fruits of your righteousness. Huh. Sounds like what Paul was talking about in another place when he talked about fruit that may abound to your account. Philippians 4, 17, our key verse for this message. He desired fruit that may abound to the account of the believers. God desires fruit to abound to each of us. And that happens as we choose to sow bountifully. Okay, so God does what? He ministers seed to the sower. You ought to me meditate on that. Seed to the, who does God give seed to? He gives it to the sower. You know, in Haggai 1 and 2, I think it's 2 verse 9, he talks about, is the seed still in the barn? You know, it's just that little question he puts in there. Well, if you read Haggai 1, it goes in context there. The people were so busy with their own sealed, C-E-I-L-E-D, sealed houses, that they weren't contributing to the work of Christ. and Their hearts had grown cold like the layout of sins. And he said, consider your ways, quote-unquote, and, quote-unquote, build the 